All right. Uh, so yeah, today I'm talking about feature toggles. So let's toggle some features. Um, before we start, this is a picture of my face with a circle in it um, and my name. Um, if you wanted to tweet any, anything at me, that's, um, that's my Twitter handle and the, a website there with some more stuff about me if you want to have a look. Um, this talk will be put up there. Um, it's still made available on YouTube. Another thing before we start, uh, thank you to our amazing sponsors. We keep saying that Fiji, uh, sorry, that uh, DDD doesn't happen um, without the sponsors, but I think it's just as much everyone who's bought a ticket and is sitting here as well. Um, doesn't happen without the YouTube audience and paying for tickets. So, thank you. All right. So I want to start by going back to the title image um, I put on my uh, on my slide here. Does anyone know where this image is from? Okay, it, uh, it's from uh, a movie called The Martian, which was released in 2018. Uh, it's an image of the NASA Mission Control Center in the context of that movie. Um, so it's set slightly in the future, a bit more futuristic than um, what you might be used to. Um, and I think it's definitely a bit of a cliche to use an image like this in my title slide. Like, you might be getting a feeling of deja vu, like you've seen this talk before. And I understand, right? Like, NASA's cool and space is really cool. And sometimes launching a new piece of software to the world feels a bit like this. But I'm using this image for my title slide with some irony, because I think this actually represents the opposite of what we want to do in the real world. Here's why. Um, NASA typically has to work really hard to prevent anything going wrong, for obvious reasons. Um, that's why they have mission control. Launching people into space is very expensive and very dangerous. Um, more so when something goes wrong. We want to avoid that. So I'm not going to spoil it, but for those who might not have seen this movie, the mission does go very wrong. Uh, basically, there's an incident, uh, and one of the astronauts, his name is Mark Watney, uh, is left on Mars by himself. Probably goes without saying that this kind of incident was unexpected, so no amount of planning or, or pre-preparation could have prepared them for this scenario. Um, and I think the real problem with this image, or the real problem with, with uh, uh, the people in mission control, was not a single person in this room um, has any agency to, to help him fix this problem. Mark's out there on his own. Um, they can't provide any direct support to Mark. Um, they actually couldn't communicate with him either. Mostly, all they can really do is just sit in front of those screens and watch as everything happens. I think we can draw some comparisons to this situation in history, uh, in the history of software development, uh, software development. So Microsoft Windows is historically very, very expensive piece of software to build, um, much like a rocket launch, right? Microsoft has to spend an enormous amount of money to make sure that there are a few, as few bugs as possible. Um, they have to be absolutely certain that everything works before they burn their copy of that software onto that disk, because once it's on that disk, and then once they put that disk inside the box, and then they put that box inside a bigger box in a truck, there's basically nothing they can do after that point. Uh, fixing something after launch for, for Microsoft, for the Windows engineers, uh, is an exercise that's very, very expensive. There are a lot of changes and new releases in this particular vi uh, version of Windows. So this delayed the launch and then thusly increased the risk. Um, and this meant that more testing was going to be required. So Microsoft always tests uh, Windows with a lot of different configurations of hardware and stuff like that. But Vista failed because of unforeseen circumstances um, that happened after launch. So essentially, they were testing the wrong things. Um, essentially, what happened with Vista particularly was they were at odds at the time with um, their hardware uh, developers. Um, and then those, those hardware builders, uh, is maybe a better word, they went against the advice of uh, Microsoft and shipped configurations that weren't really compatible with this software. So this was an unexpected event. It's probably a little bit unfair to pick on Vista because a lot of the, the same problems were true of any piece of software at the time and any Windows release or any, like any large releases of software at the time it was pretty common. So going back to the Martian for a little bit, uh, this is an image from a scene, uh, without spoiling anything again, hopefully, uh, uh, it's an image from a scene where Mark was able to make first contact with mission control back on Earth. Um, so he used a pretty clever hack uh, to, to get this to work. It was, it was quite an interesting part of the movie. Um, but 
nonetheless, communication was still pretty slow and difficult. And that's a problem. So if, if Mark was a Windows Vista user, we'd probably describe him as a power user. Uh, and the fact that he was able to communicate with the crew on Earth at all was actually largely incidental. This is probably, could be, oh, the, the same could really be said for Windows Vista as well. Um, customers would typically buy a new machine, the, the, a typical customer, not a power user, um, would, would buy a machine um, and they'd quickly find all of these bugs that were common amongst uh, lots of people who bought this. Um, and it was very difficult for them to communicate with the engineers that built Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Windows, as well as um, they couldn't really get the support they needed. Uh, if they did get in touch with support, there was often very little that uh, those Microsoft engineers could do because they had software that was boom pumped to them. So it was very difficult to change at that point. And I asked the question, is this something that we really want for our customers? Whether it be our customer um, alone by himself on Mars or a customer who's bought uh, a machine with Windows Vista on it? I don't think so. I think we've learned enough about software development over the years. Vista was a long time ago. Um, but we can do better. And that's exactly what feature toggles are for. So a quick outline. I'm going to go through a really quick abridged history of feature toggles. Um, that's important. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about what exactly a feature toggle is. Uh, and then I'm going to finish on some techniques and strategies. So the story of feature toggle starts with this book. Um, it was written by some Microsoft engineers who built Microsoft Word, early versions of Word and Excel, and one version of Windows, I can't remember which one. It was released in about 1995. Might, might be Windows 95, I'm not sure. Um, so it's kind of an old book, and I haven't actually read it. I'm not, I'm not going to admit that I've read this, um, and I probably won't recommend reading it either. I don't think a lot of the information in here is relevant anymore, but it does have one interesting um, section in the book. Uh, it goes through the details of how Microsoft was developing software at that time, what their process was. Um, essentially, it was a 10-step process, um, and it would probably look pretty familiar to most people now, um, even though this was set in 1995. This process has a name. It's not, it's not exactly like this now in modern software development, but this process is something that we use today, and it's called trunk-based development. So trunk-based development, actually, as it turns out, was pretty much, uh, it was getting pushed by um, uh, a lot of people around that time. Um, starting in around 1985 to 2005. So you had this book that came out, that was 1995, but around the same time, ThoughtWorks were, were really pushing this as well. They had a piece of, um, it was a build server called Cruise Control, uh, uh, and that was really kind of pushing the idea of continuous integration. And then something happened. We had Git and GitHub. Not to say that either of these software um, are particularly bad, like um, who uses Git? I think everyone does, right? Yeah. Um, Git introduced the idea of distributed version control, first of all, um, but also lightweight branching. So branching before Git came along was this exercise that was quite heavy. Um, it, it wasn't slow or anything like that or difficult, but uh, you did need to take an entire copy of all the code and uh, create a branch with that, um, whereas was Git was able to do that without taking an entire copy of all your code all at once. So it took up disk space. Uh, and then GitHub came along shortly after and introduced the idea of pull requests. So if you think about um, those steps in that process, there was a step where if we've successfully built our software and all the tests pass and we run our smoke tests and stuff like that, we can just merge that uh, software straight back into whatever we're working on, Microsoft Word, for example. So our feature goes straight in. But pull requests add another layer of friction there um, in order to get your software into the product um, by creating a step where you have to have a review first. Sometimes. Um, I don't know if anyone's experienced this, but have a pull request open for several days, takes a long time. That's just adding friction to the process. So people got fed up with this, uh, and then some developments start to come out after that. So around the end of 2010, um, a couple of books came out. So we have the book by Dave Farley and Jez Humble, that's Continuous Delivery, um, really pushing the idea of uh, high degrees of automation, lots of um, avoiding manual testing. Um, and trunk-based development is, is part of that book as well, as well as Accelerate. Um, you might have seen some other people in this conference talking about that book as well. Um, and these also coincide with the DevOps movement uh, and various other things as well. And this is where our story of feature toggle starts. So I want to talk about something um, that is in the continuous delivery book by 
Dave Farley. It's this idea of cones of change. So you can imagine two developers are working on a new feature. So they're working inside the same repository, for example. Um, and we can imagine working on that feature as the culmination of a, a numerous changes. So we'll, we'll open up a file, we'll make a little change there, we'll open up another file, maybe add new files, delete files, and stuff like that. And that accumulation of change is, is known as a cone of change. And the problem with uh, large amounts of change is, or, or the uh, culmination of lots of change, is that eventually that cone gets wide enough that it might clash with other cones. Um, we can see those collisions there. Um, those collisions are in the form of merge conflicts, but also it can be code that um, is going completely in two different directions. It's really not able to be merged. It's, it's, it's difficult. So we can see that, yeah, the wider our cone of change, the more likely we are to have uh, collisions there that are hard to hard to work with. So how do we fix that? Fix that with the idea of continuous integration. So instead of thinking about features, what we can do instead is start to think about something that's smaller than a feature, just a small change, some, some part of a feature, but not the whole thing, because those features could be too big um, and could be creating too many of those large cones. So uh, if we're going to go and, and change this up so that we're using continuous integration instead, it will look something like this. Uh, instead of keeping that feature to ourselves and building and building and building upon it, let's commit to the trunk, which is trunk-based development, um, small changes. And, and um, yeah, then what we can see here is we're not seeing those cones of change and we're not seeing any sort of collisions there. So that's continuous integration. If we look at trunk-based development versus um, something more traditional, like feature branches, uh, we go from having our branches be something that's long-lived. Um, feature branches, you might find you have a long-lived branch that's uh, per environment, for example. So th that's almost like the longest-lived branch you can have. You're not going to have an environment like dev uh, come and go. That's around forever. Versus something like a trunk-based um, approach where branches are all geared to be short-lived, as short as possible. What typically happens with feature branches is the batch size for a release, um, as in a new, a new version that's usable for your customers, uh, is a number of features. Just because you'll have to align a whole bunch of things and, and it uh, tends to align that you can release a bunch of features at once. Uh, whereas releasing trunk-based software, we might be releasing um, something less than a feature. That batch size is gonna be smaller than that. As well as that, because we're not releasing huge amounts of change all at once, our change risk goes from being high to low instead. So to summarize trunk-based development, it's a branching model for code collaboration on a single branch. Uh, and that's an enabler of continuous integration. Hopefully that, that makes sense. Cool, so what exactly is a feature toggle? What, is, what are feature toggles gonna do us? Uh, let's take a definition. So a feature toggle is a software engineering technique for enabling feature lifecycle management with or without deploying new code. So who's used feature toggles before? That's quite a few people too. Um, does the with or without part, without, with or without deploying new code, um, does, that, does that sound a bit odd? It did to me. I, I had maybe a picture of how feature toggles work, um, and the idea to me was we can deploy a piece of software and we can fiddle with it. We can change things, turn them off and on without having to deploy new code. Um, but actually, it turns out it's something larger than that. So let's go into it. Here's some code that is a feature toggle, feature toggle code. Um, let's go through it. We have this function here. Oh, this is TypeScript, by the way. Um, we have this feature here. We can ask for a feature by name, and this function will tell us whether that feature is enabled or not. Uh, we'll wrap it in a functional interface called feature toggle, and then we can use that functional interface to whether a feature is disabled or not, run uh, one branch of code or another. So who can tell me, uh, we don't have to answer this, it's probably quite, quite difficult, but who can tell me what happens when this code runs, or who knows? The problem is we don't know. Uh, what we actually don't have here is an implementation. All we have is interfaces and things like that. So I don't know which log message I'm gonna get. I don't have that information. So what that interface alone isn't telling me is What's the persistence of this feature toggle? Like where, where does the value live? It could live in some database, or it could live in, sorry, a relational database, NoSQL database. It could live in some sort of flat file. 
um, with an JSON file or some format that um, you've never seen before. Um, there's third-party services where we can get our feature toggles from, so Launch Darkly is uh, 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 the most common one, I think. Uh, as well as, it could just be something we calculate on the fly, or it could just be something that lives in the code somewhere. It also doesn't tell me when this feature toggle is evaluated. So this could be evaluated per request. Every time we request it, it could potentially be different. Or maybe we resolve all the values of our feature toggles at startup, um, so that they, once we start up the application, they're always the same. Maybe it's something that we resolve at build time, so we can build different versions with different feature toggles, but they, once they're built, they stay the same. Or perhaps it's something that's just completely static. It's just always the same, um, regardless of when you build it or when you run it. Uh, it also doesn't describe the longevity of the feature toggle. Like, how long is this designed to, to last for? How long, how long is this meant to be a feature to, uh, toggle for? Could be somewhere between hours or years. And I think years really means indefinitely, a very long time. It also doesn't really describe some aspects of the behavior. So we don't know anything about the input validation here. What if that feature is one that I'm not familiar with, uh, me as the code? Um, what should happen there? Should there be some sort of safe fallback? Um, should the default value be false or true? Should it throw an exception because I don't really know what the default value is? Um, and it doesn't really give me any idea of whether the uh, output of this is consistent at all. So not much there that an interface can tell us. I've got a hypothesis. Let's implement our feature toggle this way. So this is, this is a feature toggle service called always off. And what we do is we ignore the input. We don't care what feature toggle it is. We'll just always return false. We can implement the feature toggle down here in the closure. So is this a feature toggle? I think it is. It looks like, it looks like one to me, right? It implements the feature toggle interface. Um, it returns the correct value, something that I'm kind of expecting. It's a Boolean. Um, but I'm looking at this and I'm going, there's a lot of superfluous code here. I don't really need half of this, right? Um, I'm always getting the same value from this feature toggle. It's always false. So why don't I just do a bit of refactoring, right? So what if I just remove um, some of that feature toggle stuff and I just drop that false in there so it's always, because it's always going to be false. Is this a feature toggle? Well, it doesn't say it's a feature toggle anymore. There's no interface. I'm not implementing a feature toggle interface. But I think this still is a feature toggle. Let's go a step further. Um, if my compiler's having a look at this. So I'm using TypeScript, although this code kind of looks like it's, it's JavaScript by now. Um, if I'm using TypeScript, TypeScript's going to have a look at that and start to make efficiencies here and there. And it doesn't really matter if it's TypeScript or other compilers. They, they mostly do this. It'll look at that if false statement and go, well, what's the point of that? There's, it's, I don't, like, I'm never going to execute that code on line five. It's, I might as well get rid of it. So let's say the compiler has a go in it. Um, just removes that. Is that a feature toggle? Not looking much like a feature toggle anymore, but I still believe that that is. Um, that might look a bit strange, but I did title my talk "Everything's a Feature Toggle," so I had to work something like that in there. Um, yeah, it doesn't look like a feature toggle; it's just a bit of code. But yeah, that is. I'm going to give this feature toggle a name. Um, I don't think there's commonly used names for a lot of this stuff, so um, these names are just made up by me. But um, I'm going to call this a static toggle. And a static toggle is categorized uh, by being persisted in code. So I don't have to ask some database or some file for the value of this one. It's just in the code. I get static and very consistent evaluation, basically just always false. It's very, very predictable. And that's nice. Um, and this is a tool you can do, uh, you can use to do a thing called branching by abstraction. So let's talk about what that means. Let's say we have um, some old code that we want to replace. We've got a new version, maybe a new version of an algorithm that we want um, to put in there that's more efficient. Um, but what we want to do is that algorithm is going to take a little bit of um, back and forth. Maybe it's going to be multiple commits to our repository. It's going to take a little while to write. Um, I, want to, I want guarantees that I can start writing that code, make commits. Maybe someone else can kind of um, collaborate with me. But I want guarantees that that code that I've got in, that, um, in my repository is not going to run, right? So what I could do is do a commit. Um, I don't have to do a commit and, and push all of this up, but like the first change I might look at making is putting a feature toggle in front of it. And this can be an always off feature toggle. So I'm always going to go down to that um, old code path, 
So it doesn't really matter what on what's on that new code path there at the top. At the moment, there's nothing. I haven't put anything in yet. Then what I might do is start working on that new algorithm. And if I'm just playing around locally, I can switch that to an always on toggle, as long as I don't commit that anyway. Um, I can start working with that, that new algorithm, test the performance, do stuff like that. I can commit that uh, and let one of my colleagues have a play around with it, um, see if they can make it work. I get a guarantee that I know that code's not going to run um, in production, not going to make it into, uh, into the hands of users, which is quite nice. Once I'm ready, I can flip that feature toggle from being always off to always on, or I might have some other feature toggling strategy there. Um, I'll talk about more of those in a minute, but um, once I'm ready, basically, I'm going to start executing code on that new code path. Uh, and then when I'm happy with the final solution here, um, it looks like it's running perfectly fine. The last step I can do is just to remove both the feature toggle and the old version of code. It's quite a safe approach to, to incrementally adding new features, and that's what branch by abstraction is. So this is a quote from Martin Fowler's article about feature toggles, um, specifically in the context of what I've just talked about. Feature toggles are an interesting way to allow incomplete and untested code paths to be shipped to production as latent code. I sometimes call it floating code. Um, but the idea of that is that we get guarantees that it will never be turned on, it'll never be executed, which is quite nice. Let's uh, go back to our static toggle for a minute. Um, let's just work through an implementation just so we get an idea of um, what that might actually look like. So what we have here is uh, I'm looking at implementing a new version of my payment gateway. Um, maybe we've moved from XML and SOAP to something a bit nicer like Redis. Um, the idea here is that uh, the input and output, basically the interface to this payment gateway is the same. That's how we can use branch by abstraction here. Um, so I've got both implementations here, and what I can do is I can use a feature toggle, I'll put a feature toggle in front of it, and we can see that that feature toggle is, uh, by default, it's always off. But my implementation here, um, if, if my feature toggle is actually turned on at this given time, I'd use that new gateway. Um, so yeah, I can see why I've, always, I've defaulted to always off here. Here's some unit tests, because we always have to uh, test our code. Um, and we, what we can see here is we've got this one test suite. We're going to um, test uh, this old uh, version of our gateway and a new version of our gateway with the same test suite, because we know that they should behave the same mostly. Uh, if we run our tests um, with the old gateway, we can run it with that uh, always off feature toggle there. Uh, and if we want to test our new gateway, we can test it with that always on feature toggle there. We get the same test suite out of both. We can plot feature toggles um, on, a, on a graph, I guess, um, plotting longevity versus evaluation. Um, and our static toggles land in this sort of bottom corner down here. They're grouped under a section of toggles called I call release toggles. Um, and the idea is you might use something like this for a couple of days um, while you're collaborating on some new code that you're writing. You're not going to be using these all the time, by the way, as well. Um, and in terms of how, how they're evaluated, you get um, they kind of, well, they land completely in that static kind of area down there. Let's uh, continue on with some more different types of feature toggles. So this is an environment toggle. Um, a lot of people might be quite familiar with something like this if you do a lot of uh, Node.js development, but there'll be equivalents in other languages as well. Um, these are also persisted in code. Uh, and the idea here is you might evaluate this at either build time or startup. So if you're doing a web application using Webpack, you're actually evaluating stuff like this at build time, you're building different versions of your application, uh, whereas other frameworks, you might be doing that at startup. You'll decide, okay, I'm starting up. What environment am I in? I'm going to set all my features there. Um, and these are great. Sorry, I'll go back for a sec. These are great for integration and UAT testing. You might have multiple environments. You want features on in this environment, but not that environment. Uh, how are they used? Uh, what we have here is um, we've got a feature that we're wanting to use. Um, we've got this environment toggle here. Essentially, we're checking if we're in the development environment. Uh, in our development environment, we want to play around with toggles, have different stuff running, uh, so we can see, we can check for that. Uh, and then, yeah, if we're looking at our dev toggles here, we can check if, if we're matching certain toggles, what we want to have on, what we want to have off at the time. But we get a guarantee here that if we're not in the development environment, 
we turn everything off. Everything's, every, every new feature is there, uh, is off. That's really nice because um, it gives you a guarantee that you're not going to accidentally run the wrong software in the wrong environment, um, not when it's not ready. Environment toggles will are the sort of thing that are uh, built into your software development lifecycle, uh, so they'll last a little bit longer. They'll, they'll go beyond um, just collaborating and experimenting with code. They, they're built into the testing process. So like I said, you'll use them in your UAT or integration environments. Uh, and they trend over towards the, the right a little bit in terms of um, when they're evaluated. So either at build time or startup. Moving on. This is actually the type of feature toggle that I was most familiar with um, when I started uh, using them, I guess. This is an application toggle. Um, and these are the most flexible. So the idea is that the persistence will vary. When I was talking about um, where can your feature toggle be persisted, could it be in a database or um, in code or in a NoSQL database or something like that, that's usually talking about these types of feature toggles here. So this example um, runs against a SQL database. I'm running a SQL query to decide whether this feature toggle's on or off. Um, and I can do that, I can evaluate that either at startup, application starts up, I'll decide what's, what's enabled, what's not, um, or I can do that per request as well. I can turn things on and off while people are using this application. Talking about them being versatile and extendable, what we could do is we could tweak the, the interface a little bit if we wanted. So we can create a user toggle, which accepts two parameters instead of one. We've got the feature name, but also a user ID. Uh, and then what we can do is enable features for certain users. So a canary toggle is a toggle based on identifiers identifiers of your user, but not necessarily user, maybe other things as well. Probably want to evaluate these ones per request. If you've got a lot of users, you can't really evaluate this one at startup. So this is something you do per request. Um, and this is useful for Canary releases, but hence the name, right? Another type of toggle you might use um, in this kind of uh, familiar to this one as well is a calculated toggle. So the idea here is um, these, are, these go back to being persisted in code. Um, we're not going to ask a database for something like that. But what we'll do is we'll do a calculation of those per user attributes, so something like a user ID. Um, and we'll use that in order to split our traffic um, in a certain way. What we can do is um, this example here, we've got a, a hash. Um, you don't want to see how that sausage is made. It's, it's, uh, there's quite a complex um, little algorithm there. But the idea is you input a string and you get a number that's somewhere between one and zero. And what we can do is our calculated toggle just checks if that number is greater than 0.05, and that's actually going to split our cohort essentially in half. Um, again, you'd evaluate this per request, uh, and this is something you'd use in A-B testing. So we can see these three types of feature toggles. They, they, uh, they land in this kind of section called experiment toggles. Uh, what we can see is um, they trend more towards the right, where they're evaluated typically per request, although sometimes not. Um, and these are something you'll, you'll leave in your system a little bit longer still. Um, something you want to um, have running in production, you can play around with, turn things off and on. Here's another type of feature toggle. This is a circuit breaker. So like a canary toggle or a calculated toggle is a calculation of user attributes, a circuit breaker is slightly different. It's, a, uh, it's based on a calculation of your current system. Um, so what you want to do is evaluate that probably per request as well. You wouldn't want to evaluate that at startup because your system health at startup is not the same as it's going to be later on. Um, and then in this example, what we're doing here is um, uh, we're, we're checking for queue depth. So essentially, if, if, our, if our queue is getting too long, if we've got too many things to process, what we can do is return false and we can back off. We can essentially stop adding new things to that queue. Um, we can disable features if our system health uh, isn't looking too good. These are really useful for operational purposes. Similarly, uh, there's the idea of a kill switch as well. So this code example is for an express middleware. Um, and we can actually see a, a different feature toggles embedded in there. But the idea here is we can just disable an entire endpoint that we don't, we don't want to um, our customers to have access to. Maybe something's dead, not working, or maybe that endpoint's not even there. Um, and this is essentially just a manually managed circuit breaker. So we'll notice a problem, 
Um, the difference here is it's not automated, whether that feature toggle's on or off, we're doing that manually as well. These feature toggles, um, because they're operational toggles, they're going to last a lot longer in our system. We don't really know when exactly we're going to need to use these or not. They're probably going to live in your system a little bit longer. Um, so longevity, somewhere up in, in months, maybe even indefinitely. Uh, and we can also see uh, as well, they, they, there's an overlap there with that application toggle as well. So you can use those. Um, you might have seen in, inside the kill switch there was that application toggle as well. Um, so you can see some overlap there. The last category of feature toggles I want to talk about is something called customization. Um, so you might have heard customization versus personalization before. We'll talk about that in a sec. But uh, this example here, I haven't got any code to show you, but this example here is GitHub. So they've got a little um, feature preview modal that you can access. Um, and if, you're, if you want, you can enable certain features that they're currently running through. They don't want everyone to have access to it, but if you're interested in using that feature, you can enable that yourself. Um, you have control over it. That's the important part. Um, that differentiates customization versus personalization. So these customizations are the sort of thing you might want to run for um, a longer period of time as well. They fall under a category of toggles called permission toggles. We can see that the canary lives in here as well. Um, this is the differentiation between customization and personalization. So personalization are those canary toggles. Uh, and personalizations are the, the difference there is whether we as the developers or the, the people making the product are uh, deciding whether those feature toggles are shown to those customers or those features are versus customization. Those customers are opting in themselves. So I've shown you a bunch of different types of feature toggles and what they look like. Let's quickly talk about some techniques and strategies. So if you remember branching by abstraction and our trunk-based development stuff, um, before, when we had feature branches, what we did is we, we put all of our branching into our source control. So we'd have lots of branches running different versions of the software there. And that was quite hard to manage. Many, many branches, lots of merge conflicts when we're trying to merge things over the top of each other. Difficult, right? Branching's bad. Uh, but we did have versions of our code that didn't have as many branches in them. So we'd have this linear code execution path. When we moved to trunk-based development, we didn't solve that problem. All we did was move it. So we moved our branching, our stuff that's hard that we don't really like, we moved that into our code. And that's not necessarily bad, like code's easier to work with. It's, it's nicer and we get more flexibility and control, whereas source control's a bit rigid and has limitations, right? Um, but we just moved the problem. That's important to know. So there's three things that are potentially true of any long-lived feature branch feature branches um, in our old way of working. Any feature branch that's been around for a long time has either already been merged or it can't be merged. There's too many conflicts. It's not possible anymore. Or it's code that's no longer relevant. It's been superseded by something else. And the same three or similar three characteristics are true of any feature toggle you've had in your system for a very long period of time. So those feature toggles are permanently on or they're permanently off, so you can remove them. Um, otherwise, if they're somewhere in the middle, like they're a canary that's been running for a very long period of time, you're actually probably at the stage where that isn't a feature toggle anymore. It's actually part of your business logic. So we want to be removing toggles where we can. Um, our idea here is that basically in all three of these cases here, we can, we can remove that feature toggle if it's been around for a very long period of time. So, Let's make sure we remove our feature toggles. Uh, essentially, one thing to remember here, one thing to take away is that every feature toggle should have an expiry. So here's an interesting piece of code. This is a test. Um, what we have here is the toggle, like a, it's a test that fails um, if your feature toggle is still in the system after one month. I wouldn't recommend doing this because what happens with something like this is uh, your developer who's working on the code at the time sees this random test failing, um, and what they'll do is they'll just remove that test. That isn't going to work very well. Or they'll change the date to 2022. Developers are lazy. So the best way to approach this instead is to remove feature toggles proactively. Make an effort to do it. Um, make sure you, you go and check and see if anything's still, still in use and go and do that yourself. But do it proactively. Uh, the other lesson is naming toggles. So I've got a feature toggle here. It's called internal staff. 
Um, and we can see it uses one version of a payment gateway of internal staff on here. The problem here is this feature toggle's naming is a bit vague. And if I dig a little bit, what I find is that it's being used in other places. So this isn't good. Um, the problem here is I've got a feature toggle um, that uh, when I turn it on, I actually don't really know all the things that it could be potentially either enabling or disabling. It's not very specific. Um, it looks like here, I get a new version of a payment gateway, um, but also I send different emails and I use different algorithms. So do I want to turn this on or not? So it's important to be specific. If we're talking about names, let's try and come up with a better name, right? What if we took the JIRA ticket? Stuck that in there. Well, now you've got this problem where if I'm looking at a feature toggle and I'm wanting to work out what it does, I now have to jump into JIRA and, and do this very slow and hard. I'm just I'm, I'm putting in indirection for the sake of it. So that's not great. So avoid indirection as well. The other thing is naming-wise, don't be, don't be cutesy because that's the same thing. That's just indirection as well. So if I'm looking at that feature toggle, this feature toggle called George, I don't know what that does. If I've just got that. I haven't got the, haven't got the code. I'm just... Looking at, at George, it doesn't tell me what it does. So probably a best, the best version um, of a name for this particular feature toggle is use old payment gateway or something like that. So that if it's on, I know I'm going to that old payment gateway. Lastly, I think it's important to also make sure you have an audit log of some kind um, when you're using feature toggles. Uh, just because you're changing the way your application works, right? So um, if there's something that goes wrong as a result of that, we really need to know, uh, I guess, when, when that change happens so that we can kind of track that down and make sure that um, we're able to fix that. So it's a debugging, um, uh, it's a debugging problem. So if we go and look at all the different types of feature toggles that we can use, um, using an audit log kind of differs depending on what you're doing. When you have these, static and environment toggles, it's actually really easy. You've already got an audit log because those, those feature toggles live in code. So um, anything that lives in code is already audited by source control. That's really nice. We don't have to do anything. If you've got some of these um, uh, database-driven ones or these uh, application feature toggles, um, what you might want to use is a change log. And you want that change log to live probably close to where the actual value of the feature toggles persisted. Um, so if you're putting your feature toggles in a database, have a secondary table that tells us when those feature toggles were changed. And lastly, if you've got one of the calculated styles of feature toggles, so the circuit breaker or a calculated A-B test feature toggle, um, you need some sort of decision log. Just log when a decision was made um, about enabling a feature or disabling a feature. That, can, that doesn't actually have to be too complicated, just log message. Um, send it to your log aggregator, and, and then you can just track it later. Cool. So these are the lessons, the techniques. Um, remove feature toggles proactively. Use deliberate and descriptive naming. Uh, and make sure to use an audit log. That's really important. Cool. So I think it's important to look back over the history of software development to, and draw from some of the lessons that we've learned um, over this journey. So we might assume that techniques like feature toggling um, they kind of just appeared one day, but the reality is we went through a journey of um, lots of failures and, and learning from those failures. Um, we talked about the many forms of uh, feature toggle that you can have um, and how they map in terms of, um, sorry, how they map in terms of uh, plotting them in terms of evaluation versus longevity. So evaluation being how often are we, are we looking for that value and how often does that value change versus um, how long we just we are deciding that feature toggle is going to live for in our system. And like any technique that we have in software development and software architecture, there's always going to be trade-offs. So the best example here is we wanted to avoid branching and source control because it was rigid and it was difficult and merge conflicts are hard, right? Um, but all we ended up doing was taking that branching strategy and moving that somewhere else. It moved into our code. So now we have to have appropriate uh, mechanisms to deal with that as well. Be aware of some of the techniques that we have at our disposal and the many ways that we can use them, uh, as well as how to use them properly. 
use feature toggles as a tool to plan for the unexpected. Because the unexpected is something that's always going to happen. Take this picture and basically the whole story of this movie. Uh, planning for the unexpected can make a huge difference to the, difference to the success of your product, uh, but also the experience for your customers. I'm going to thank the sponsors again, um, as I can. Uh, but also, I want to point out that I work for one of the companies on this slide. Uh, that's these guys here. If uh, feature toggles and, and the idea of using them uh, is interesting to you. We use them a lot. We play around with uh, the various different versions in as well. Um, we're also hiring. I'm up here doing the, the hiring spiel because um, we're looking for people. So if, if you're interested, come talk to me or um, we have a booth down in, in the back corner um, with Jacob and Travis down there. They'll give you a free pair of socks. If you haven't got them already, they look really cool. That's been me. Thank you. <laughs>